and it looks like we are now live. So, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone tuning in. We are so happy to have you join us. Uh, my name is Tahil Sharma, and I'm the Regional Coordinator for North America for the United Religions Initiative. And we welcome you to this third workshop for Interconnected Justice, a series that we've been hosting in the region to help uh, promote CCs and the work that they're doing on the ground to promote narratives and themes of justice in their communities. Uh, for those of you that don't know or haven't heard of the United Religions Initiative, uh, we are the largest grassroots uh, multi-faith network of uh, organizations that are grassroots that are working on the ground to make cultures of peace, justice, and healing a daily routine in the world. Uh, we are very, very happy to have over 1,070 of these cooperation circles or chapter organizations in 110 countries. And I'm very happy to have over 90 of those here in the United States and Canada as regional coordinator. Um, and this is a great opportunity for you all, if you're interested, uh, to learn more about the organization at uri.org. Um, make this an opportunity to, you know, think about the ways that your interfaith communities are getting more involved in the work for peace, justice, and healing. But most importantly, we're very excited to have this special session on Apologies. My computer tends to freeze once in a while, but this will be mitigated in a, in in some time. Um, first and foremost, I wanna make sure that I wish everyone here on this call today a very happy Earth Day. Today is Earth Day and what a better time and occasion to be able to talk about environmental justice by inviting some of our amazing leaders from cooperation circles on the ground to talk about what that grassroots and advocacy work looks like. Um, but first, I definitely wanna open up this space to our climate action coordinator here at URI. Um, Lauren Van Ham will be starting us off with an invocation. Lauren, take it away. Thank you, Tahil. Happy Earth Day, URI community and friends. It is a good day and I am so happy I can be with you. As Tahil said, my name is Lauren Van Ham. I am an eco-chaplain and it is my joy to serve the United Religions Initiative as Climate Action Coordinator. Today, I am speaking to you from the territory of the Ohlone people and from the Baxter Creek watershed, which feeds me. Before we do anything else, I invite each one of us to give our thanks to the people on whose territory we have made our homes and for the land and the water which sustain us. Even with your microphones muted, please feel free to speak their names aloud now, inviting their wisdom and their presence to our gathering today. Thank you for bringing our minds, our hearts, and the places where we live together in this way. Friends, we have a true crisis on our hands. It's evident in myriad and interconnected ways as Tahil is sharing throughout this 2021 series on interconnected justice. We see and feel the climate crisis in the masses of people looking for a safe place to call home, in the demonstrations raising everyone's consciousness around racial justice and inequalities for so many, in the pandemic, and of course, in the fires and floods, volcanoes and earthquakes, cyclones and hurricanes that somehow are becoming daily news. At its best, Earth Day is a moment we shower Mother Earth with our loving acts and renewed commitment to revere her and to care for her. At its worst, Earth Day is a fleeting moment that pretends to make up for our ridiculous, wasteful, and dangerous practices as consumers. If we have been on calls together, or you have been following my communications with cooperation circles, then you know that URI is responding to the climate crisis through acts of learning together and taking collective action. 
One of the ways we're growing our impact is by focusing on 11 climate cooling activities or drawdown solutions that link directly with the UN's sustainable development goals. In this Earth Day session, you are going to hear from two of URI's CCs, cooperation circles, who are doing world changing work by providing training and access to these climate, co climate cooling practices and directly helping humans to be part of the solution while also improving their lives at the same time. On this Earth Day, let's remember our place in an intricate and interdependent web of life. As CCs in North America and every region of the globe, let's unite in thoughtful, creative, and powerful acts of restoring Earth and all her species. I invite you to pray with me. Creator, source, spirit of life, we call upon the brilliance of evolution, the miraculous force that inspires rocks to become breath. Just as you have turned caterpillars into butterflies, grant us the courage to metamorphose. Awaken in us the curiosity we need to evolve wisely and respond in this present moment. Help us to recognize the actions of our short lives as integral and worthy within the billions of years past and the future generations yet to come. Cradle us in the cycle of life so that we might fearlessly embrace and honor with trust and grace the sacred processes that carry each of us through birth, death, and rebirth. And finally, please fill us with a generosity that is like the sun's, so that our activism, practice, and efforts might be imbued with endurance and with joy. May Earth and all creation feel our renewed, renewed and ongoing care for her today. In your many holy names we pray, blessed be, and so it is. Lauren, thank you for that important reflection and the important moment that we continue to stand in at this moment because uh, we know that among the varying crises that may coexist at once in this moment, the ecological crisis is probably one of the most significant and all impacting um, in the ways that we see futures for ourselves and our children. And if we don't look to take care of nature and mother earth, then um, none of us will be able to see a better day to come. And we wanna give you the gratitude you deserve for all of the amazing work you've done for the network and for so many cooperation circles on the ground. So thank you for that. Um, to, uh, for those of you that might be learning about United Religions Initiative for the first time, uh, we are guided by a set of uh, 21 principles that help remind us of our interconnectedness and our need to be able to work collaboratively to make a better world. One uh, principle in particular, principle 10, uh, inspires us and reminds us to act from ecologically sound practices to protect and preserve the earth for both present and future generations. Um, our principles and mission and values are dedicated to this idea that we remind ourselves to not only just respect one another, but to respect nature and the ecosystems that we coexist with because without them, we are not able to survive. And I have the humble privilege of being able to invite uh, some amazing folks from cooperation circles who are doing work on the ground. Um, I would like to introduce you to Janice Kelsey, who's the executive director for uh, Solar City CC. And I'm also introducing you to Alice Druffel, who's the Southern California director for the California chapter of Interfaith Power and Light. Um, they will be talking to you about what that grassroots work looks like, whether you're wanting to work on um, smaller projects that might help you to support ecological practices, or whether you're looking to be advocates uh, for larger reforms and changes that are necessary for those who might be harming the environment. 
So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Janice. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Tahil. Um, I'd like to get my PowerPoint uh, presentation set up. Oops, and I made a mistake already. Of course. Bring that to the front. Bring this over here. Share screen. And I'm not seeing the whole thing. Have you clicked at the bottom of the um, share screen section to make sure that you're on the right screen, Dennis? Yeah, let me, um, let me try this again. Play from current slide. And I need to swap. What do you see, Tahil? Uh, Janice, you have to make sure that you're on the Zoom screen first oh, to right. yeah. click on the share screen button before you do that. My Zoom. Should have ran through that this morning. <laughs> click that. Okay. Great. Yeah, and I then... clicked the one, but it didn't work. Okay, so we're going to start this from current slide. And then... What are you seeing, Tahil? You just need to click swap displays and you'll be good. How are we now? Awesome. Good, all right, here we go. All right, hopefully you'll be hearing from two of us today. I'm Janice Kelsey, executive director and one of the co-founders of Solar Cities. I taught for many, many years in alternative schools and uh, home education. I've been an adult leader in Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, Venture Crew and 4-H. Um, in addition to being the founder of Solar Cities, T.H. Colhane is a professor at the University of South Florida's Patel College of Global Sustainability and Mercy College in New York. He is also a National Geographic Explorer and an urban planner. And T.H. will be joining us a bit later for the Q&A. So therefore we educate. Um, our mission is to bring free, clean energy and nutrient dense fertilizer through our education programs and to assist in the development of what we call biogas education hubs. Um, one in every state and one in every country where we work, that's our goal. So our purpose is to promote accessible clean energy and food producing technologies that make sense. We each teach these skills according to our own knowledge and strengths in these skills. And we both teach the basics of how to build a biodigester because the biodigester is at the core of what we teach. We also encourage and promote the growing biogas businesses we know, and we continue the research needed for closing the waste to energy and fertilizer to food loop. We teach all grade levels, participate in community events, share biogas as appropriate technology in permaculture courses, and we participate in community action and education of local and state leaders. We would not be where we are if not for our student interns because we teach, we also share with many students. They come in and help out quite a bit. They learn and they move on to, uh, to greater, greater things or we, we keep some of them. So we have and have had both local and international students from all career paths, law, business, engineering, nursing, public health. They have come from as close as down the street to being from Colombia, Germany, Nigeria, Nepal, and China. I'm sure I missed someone. Um, they are the backbone of our nonprofit organization as well as our cooperation circle. Even if not by name, I wanted to make sure to show our appreciation for them here. So as you can see, like many cooperation circles, we are mostly teachers and students, but the fact is we are all learners learning together like we are here today. While you are listening today, I would like you to consider a few of our needs as a cooperation circle and as a nonprofit and see if anything resonates with you. In order to be uh, more, ev to, uh, sorry, in order to be even more impactful, we're looking to increase our board capacity with experienced leadership we're looking for sponsorships and partnerships from individuals or corporations whose hearts and missions align with ours. And we also welcome student interns, volunteers who wish to be a part of what we do. 
So I'm gonna start with our logo. We call our little biodigesters baby dragons because we relate them to living creatures. They're warmed by the sun. You can see the sun in the background. They breathe fire. You can see the blue flame. And they give us dragon tinkle, for, better, for lack of a better word, for fertilizer. And when it's cold, they hibernate. The first thing people often ask us is, why solar in the name Solar Cities? Besides the fact that T.H. Colhane named it for the city of the sun in Egypt where he first started, biogas is solar energy. Energy from the sun is stored in the leaves and the trees in the food that we eat and in every living thing you see around you. You can think of the leaves on the trees and the food that grows in your garden as nature's solar panels with the ability to store energy. Now, the word cities is an acronym. The C3 is in cities represents connecting community catalysts. That's what URI is doing right now by bringing us all together. The purpose is to integrate technologies for industrial ecology solutions. So we community catalysts are gathering together in cooperation circles to bring together technologies and skills to create small scale local solutions to large scale ecological problems. Solar cities is not limited to biogas, but it is the focal point of what we share. Now, Solar Cities is not just a, a nonprofit, but a global movement. Um, people have been building biodigesters for many years, but it has, it has really, um, it has really ramped up in the last, I'd say, ten years. And I believe that that started um, because of a Facebook group that T. H. Colhane started called Solar Cities Biogas Innovators and Practitioners. Um, there are members in there who are developing small DIY and even commercial systems appropriate for their region of the world. Working and sharing together, um, we, we've been working and sharing together in a non-competitive way in order to build an industry to save our environment, our health, and our economies. We all know that there aren't enough, um, enough people out there doing this um, fast enough, so we're, it's really ramping up. And by way of our membership in the United uh, Religions Initiative, um, we are able to reach out to even more people around the world. And they in turn are reaching out to the people of their own communities and their own regions. This technology is often referred to and may be more familiar to you as waste to energy. But unfortunately, the word waste has a very negative meaning and is often understood as simply being, being wasteful. And we want people to understand that there is no such thing as waste. So the language is changing. Sustainable development goal number 12 says responsible consumption and production. So when we are talking about waste to energy, we, were, we are actually talking about um, production and consumption residuals. So I, I started with production residuals for this example. Production residuals would be what is left over from growing or producing food. For example, in a cafeteria, people are producing food. They're producing meals for other people. So what remains after that production is production residuals. Consumption residuals would be what we waste as consumers of those products. Using the cafeteria ex example again, that would be whatever food was left on the person's plate. So we're talking about small scale solutions, things that you and I can do. As I said earlier, biogas is solar energy too, and you can learn how to ha harness that energy through biodigestion. So I, I like to call ourselves a small but mighty nonprofit. Uh, this technology has um, plenty of big interest and here are just some of our partners. Um, we're working with food security uh, Structures Canada. They are creating integrated food systems to grow affordable food year round. We're working with advanced cooling technologies here in Pennsylvania who are helping us to um, create thermal controls for biodigesters in cold climates so we can use this year round here in the cold weather. We're working with Energy Vision, Solar One, and the New York City Board of Education in New York. 
Um, we are working on a middle school, high school biogas curriculum that aligns with their uh, science, um, uh, science um, curriculum. We're also working with, um, I just got back actually from the Dakotas where um, we're working with Chief Arvel and Paula Looking Horse um, at Lake Traverse Reservation. We are working on food sovereignty and better health for food First Nations. We were very, very blessed to be able to hand out 18 tower gardens to the schools and a number of, um, of uh, tribal members there. Uh, next is Rosebud Continuum Sustainable Education Center in Florida. That is where T.H. Colhane lives, and you'll hear more from him later. They focus on sustainability, conservation, and cultural preservation. We also are partnering with Base Nepal and the United Nations for a, an energy independence, educational and vocational training for the Taru, who is an underserved population in Nepal. And um, most recently, we are developing a relationship um, with UR, URI's East Africa Great Lakes region, um, and we are calling our project East Africa Biogas Project. So I'm going to start with the basics with biogas. Um, most of you are familiar with composting, right? So you see a picture on the left, we're composting, and picture on the right, this is a biodigester. It's a, called an IBC tank. It, uh, it is a closed system. We're talking about the difference between air and no air. So on the left, we compost using air and that breaks down with one kind of mi microbe, but there's another microbe that you use for anaerobic bi biodigestion and we use that in a closed container. So it's aer aerobic versus anaerobic. Um, the microbes in a biodigester are the same microbes that are in you and me, the same microbes that are in a cow or a pig. We're creating a system similar to a stomach here that's going to digest what we put in it. So it has a, you can see a feeding outlet here on the left, a fertilizer outlet on the right, and a gas outlet right here in the center. So we, it's painted black to absorb the heat of the sun, but also to block the sunlight from growing algae in the tank, which would create oxygen, which would then kill the anaerobic microbes. You wouldn't want air in your belly and neither does a biodigester. I took this graphic from a small manual that we just published recently called How to Build a Solar City's IBC Tank Biodigester. Um, that little book has a whole series of instructions on how to build a biodigester yourself. Um, and I'd like to use the bread analogy um, of simple but not easy. Um, bread is very simple. You don't need many ingredients, flour and water. Uh, you need yeast to uh, rise. You can get fancier with your bread further on by adding different things. Um, but anybody who is used to baking bread knows that it, the process is simple, um, but by saying it's not easy, what I'm saying is it takes practice. Somebody had to teach you how to make bread. They, somebody had to teach you that flour and water together could make bread and adding yeast can make it rise. You need to know how to, to, how to knead the bread and you need to know to let it rise and then to punch it down and, and that whole thing. So, so I equate the biodigester, learning how to uh, use a biodigester, learning how to build a biodigester to, to baking bread. You just have to learn step by step. Now, this graphic brings in everything that we talk about in our biogas education program. Um, we have a tank here, you can see it's square. This is actually an IBC tank, like the one you saw in the first graphic. It's, I've taken the cage off so that you can look through the biodigester and see our all the pipes in there. We basically, on the bottom, we have stones or gravel, or you can put all kinds of things in here that acts as an environment for your microbes to live on. Just like we have intestines where the, uh, the microbes in our, uh, our gut um, have um, a place to live. They have lots of surface area. So that's our surface area. And right here, in order to start a biodigester or you can run a biodigester on animal manure, you're going to have to put some fresh manure in there that has live microbes, all right? And then after we're done building our biodigester with our three different types of pipes, we're gonna fill that up with water. Okay, so to build our biodigester, to back, backtrack, it's very simple. Any place that has any kind of a container, it does not have to be an IBC tank. It can be a 55 gallon drum. It can be a 100 gallon water 
drum. It could be any kind of container that you can seal tightly where you bring your pipes in and out and your gas outlet. So you've got your feeding tube here that you're going to be feeding once this starts functioning and digesting and creating gas from these microbes down here. Okay, that gas is going to rise up here and out here. And once that lights, then we know that we can, our, our biodigester is alive, our ba baby uh, dragon is alive. We can start feeding. So this is our feeding port. And this is where our fertilizer is going to be drawn out of. We're going to have pressure because this is nice and high. Food goes in, it creates pressure in the tank. And then out of the path of least resistance is this hole right here in about the center of the tank. And then your fertilizer goes out into a bucket where then you can water it down and you can use it on your garden. You can use it on your house plants. You can use it on your lawn. You can, if you have a big biodigester, you can use it in your fields. So that is a very simple explanation of a biodigester. So one of our key goals is, is to establish biogas education hubs. A biogas education hub is a place where people can go to learn about biodigestion and other related subjects like organic gardening, small scale farming, hydroponics, aeroponics, solar energy, etc. Each biogas education hub is a separate entity all its own, but they are re recognized by solar cities as being a place of learning that shares what we have shared with them. From north to south, we start with Hudson Valley Vertical Farms. Kathy Puffer is another co-founder and founding board member of Solar Cities. She and her family have the first indoor year-round biodigesters in their basement. Kathy offers tours and educational programs as her, at her biogas education hub in Tilson, New York. You can see in this picture, she's, this is inside, it's underneath her kitchen. She has kitchen waste come down into these two um, IBC tank biodigesters and she cooks on the gas all year round because the temperature is uh, pretty steady there. I apologize if I have to go through these quickly because of the limited time, but our next biogas education hub is in Glenmore, PA. It incorporates two sites that work cooperatively. The first is at my home where we have outdoor biodigesters that function nine months out of the year. These are IBC tank biodigesters with one cubic meter gas storage bags. You can see them right here. In the back, you can see 55 gallon blue drums that capture the fertilizer as it comes out of the biodigester. We also have on our property, um, another biodigester that is insulated with foam. This is a soy based foam and has two windows on the other side for passive solar gain. It warms up the biodigester. We have a floating IBC tank gas holder on the right and the gas is hooked up to a grill over to the right. We also teach people how to convert the gas grills from propane to biogas. There's a workshop for that. We bring our gas inside the house to our two burner biogas stove. It is actually built for biogas. I know you can adapt other gas stoves. I don't know how, so I just have a small stove, but I love the blue flame. Look how clean that is. A blue flame is a clean flame. The second part of our biogas education hub is just one mile away at Bob and Jody Spangler's farm. Jody is another co-founder of Solar Cities. Here we have the 10 cubic meter Solar Cities biodigester that they use for agricultural residuals, cow manure and food production residuals. It acts like a septic tank. See, it's now under the ground while also capturing the biogas, which can be collected in a bag or it can be run right to a stove or to a heater or to wherever you're using it. They use the fertilizer on their fields and we are testing some of the fertilizer in grow, in grow walls. So there is no waste. This is Jody's year round indoor farm, Adragon Aeroponics. This integrated food system is built from a recycled shipping container. It's been insulated with a soy-based foam and painted with a special reflective antimicrobial silver coating. It is filled with vertical aeroponic grow walls that saves over 90% water usage. EMS lighting and solar energy significantly reduces their energy costs. This year-round farm was born out of Solar City's goal of closing the waste to energy and fertilizer to food loop. 
When I first met T.H. Colhane, <clears throat> Jody Spangler and I had already been working in vertical aeroponic growing with a simple grow system called the, the Tower Garden by the Juice Plus Company. Very simply put, hydroponics is horizontal. Aeroponics is vertical. Vertical growing saves space and water. A beloved friend of ours, Bob Hamburg, once said with great conviction, the gas is groovy, but it's the fertilizer that's valuable. That's where my mind has always been. Minerals used in any kind of farming, indoors or outdoors, is mined from the earth. These minerals are finite. We're not worried right now, but we will run out. Hydroponics and aeroponics uses these minerals more efficiently, but ultimately, over time, we still need something better. Into our lives walks T.H. Colhane with biodigestion, which brings us to our third biogas education hub in the US, which is located in Land Lakes, Florida at Rosebud Continuum. This is where TH lives off grid with his wife and baby son. Here you see TH playing with solar panels. He's our high tech wizard. He gets into the solar panels and diverters and generators and, and all of that stuff. So what's really exciting right now is that TH is expanding sustainability education from the real world and bringing it into the virtual world. From actual tours and hands-on hands -on exploration, he is adding the ability to learn even more through virtual reality in any part of the world. So on the upper left hand, you can see um, this is a big biodigester. They actually have three biodigesters, Pushin biodigesters like this. Um, one above ground, which is here, one halfway down into the ground, and one below, which over in the virtual reality area, you can see that over here. So he can share more about that. So in the islands to our south is the University of Notre Dame de Haiti, where we have partnered with Public-Private Alliance and others to help their nursing and public health programs to develop a complete biogas education course of study as it relates to both fields. The knowledge and skills learned here have already begun to spread out into the greater community. All the way over in West Africa, we have Boma Mohamed Chi of Royal Renewable Energy Cameroon. Mr. Boma is a skilled craftsman in the construction of brick and mortar biodigesters. He has been a very good friend and a member of Solar Cities for quite a number of years now. He operates what was the first recognized biogas education hub in Africa at RECAM's Biogas Technology and Sustainable Agriculture Experimental Farm. He is a peace builder. He welcomes training part participants from all walks of life in Cameroon and in Nigeria and beyond. When he travels to build his large community biodigesters, he also offers training in the baby dragon to the villages nearby. I'm going to go through this quite quickly. These are innovative biogas companies globally, but I just wanted you to be aware that they're out there. Um, when we first started, the, the, the smallest biodigester you could have in an agricultural community like where I live would be a lagoon biodigester. And, and they considered a small farm to be 500 head of cattle. That's a little big for me. So getting a little bit smaller in the U.S., um, a company um, in the U.S., we've, we have Impact Bioenergy. It was founded by Jan Allen in the state of Washington. This is, of course, a 20-foot shipping container with all the workings of a biodigester system inside. It is fabulous for small restaurants or other small venues that have uh, food residuals. Um, we also have uh, up in Canada, CCI Bioenergy, which I believe is a subsidiary of Cube Renewables in the United Kingdom. Also in Canada, we have Food Security Structures Canada, which started with Greg Whiteside, a member of our Facebook group, building a Solar Cities IBC tank biodigester inside a movie studio in Canada to deal with their uh, residuals um, for their uh, staff and crew and, and actors. So now he and his business partner, Kim uh, Parker, have started their own business and they are integrating technologies in order to build year-round indoor food growing systems that can be built anywhere, even in the far north northern regions of Canada. 
Currently, they're working on a year-round subterranean farm for indigenous people of Nunavut, where shipping fresh food in happens only twice a year and at an unbelievable cost. A small head of lettuce is $25. Further to our south, now to the south of the U.S., there's Sistema Biobolsa, founded by Alex Eaton in Mexico. Sistema um, offers a tubular biodigester system and offers distributorships in other countries. In China is Dr. Jianan Wang, who has graciously worked with TH Colhane and I on product development and distribution. Biogas technology is actually a very old technology that has a very long history in both China and India. This is a forgotten art that's being brought back to the US by companies like Pushin and Biotech with Dr. Sajidas of India. They have developed many green products from biodigesters to aquaculture systems. This is a photo of an earlier design on the left and what is called the mosquito unfriendly design on the right, which is completely closed. Biotech India also offers training and distributorships. Yair Teller and his diverse team members in Israel have recently developed this third iteration of home biogas backyard biodigester. Home biogas is now available in 57 countries, including the US. Home Biogas does retail sales and partners with the UN and other humanitarian organizations. Dominic Wanjahia of Flexi Biogas in Kenya is one of the earliest members of our Facebook group. He has developed an affordable and easy to deploy tubular biodigester as well as a much larger system. It's an expandable system that he calls the T-Rex for large scale agricultural use. Flexi Biogas does resale sales consulting, and he also partners with humanitarian aid or organizations. Katrin but Putz is known in our biogas wor world for having developed the backpack biogas bag. If you don't have your own biodigester, you can go fill a bag at your neighbor's biodigester and carry it home. Katrin believes in true independence and offers a biogas and, and business training program, as well as a distributorship Alphabetically, she has shared this technology and B Energy's business opportunities in Benin, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, India, Kenya, Malawi, and Rwanda. One of her trainees was Mr. Boma Mohamed Chi. He could tell you more about that, and I hope that he is on the call today. T.H. Colhane's former student, Isabel Galliano, who I know is on the call today, and her business partner, Harry Charles, started Energy Moto based in Arusha, Tanzania, that focuses on providing renewable solutions for energy sources, especially biogas and solar energy production. And last night, they celebrated their very first flame of their newborn baby dragon, which brings us to our project partners with URI. So URI East Africa Biogas Project. This is what we're calling, this is what we're calling our newest project. So. It started with Lauren Van Ham, URI's Climate Action Coordinator and your host today. She introduced me to Nakedjwe Maywood of URI Africa Great Lakes. Um, let me give a description of URI cooperation circles in Africa. They are actively engaged in peace building, social development, access to healthcare, education for girls, environmental protection, promoting the teaching of the golden rule, treat others the way you want to be treated, good governance, reconciliation, social justices, human, human dignity, and empowerment of youth. They address the issue of HIV AIDS, human trafficking, violent extremism, radicalization, and hate speech. They encourage dialogue among different religions, cultures, and ethnic, ethnicity groups. May then introduced us to two other CCs in the Great Lakes region. First, Elizabeth, the head of programs at Prometra, a cooperation circle that promotes traditional medical knowledge and practices for improvement, improved health. Their work is done alongside integrated human health, animal health, plant health, environmental health, and community development programs. They continue to, um, towards the preservation of their cultural heritage and sacredness of nature with the intention to improve health and livelihood as well as to live in harmony in a healthy planet and to inform policy makers. And May also introduced us to Shambusho Patience, Youth Ambassador with URI and Program Director of Muisimbi Voice of Youth in Conservation, 
Part of their conservation efforts is to protect the mountain gorilla through connecting community with nature. His community surrounds Volcanoes National Park, Ningwe National Park, and Gishwati Mukua National Park. This collaboration just made sense. Um, it is in perfect alignment with what we do and what we believe. This is the typical way we gather. Um, joining us in the project to share their experience and biogas wisdom will be Royal Renewable Energy Cameroon and Energy Moto of Tanzania to make the educational process even more smooth by relating to local resources. Our first step begins with an online education program for these Cooperation Circle members next week. So we're talking about the sustainability, sustainable development goals and how biogas relates to that. And I'm gonna go through those. So number one, no poverty. Re bio, we're talking about biogas. So it reduces the need to purchase charcoal. Reduces, it produces free cooking fuel and fer fertilizer. Can sell extra fuel and fertilizer for added income. Number two, zero hunger. Nutrient dense fertilizer regenerates soil and increases crop yields, thus providing more food for families and livestock. Number three, good health and well being eliminates indoor air pollution, thus contributing to the health and well being of people who traditionally cook on open fire. That is known that that is known to cause serious illness and death. Number four, quality education, hands on biogas education offers valuable life skills, as well as vocational skills. It incorporates science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics skills. Number four, I mean, number five, sorry, gender equality. In regions of great need, a biodigester offers less time for women and girls who would normally be cl collecting firewood, less shame of open defecation. It offers great, greater safety, more time for studies, and an income opportunity for women. Number six, clean water and sanitation. Human manure becomes valuable and animal manure becomes even more valuable. Human manure is kept and used for fuel rather than dumped. And human manure is used to start or fuel a biodigester. Pathogens are contained and no longer released into waterways. Number seven, affordable and clean energy. Eliminates the need for carbon-based fuels like charcoal and propane and generates free, clean, renewable energy. Number eight, decent work and economic growth. Reduces or eliminates the need to spend money on charcoal, create energy from waste. The fertilizer can be used as a revenue stream. Number nine, industry, innovation, and infrastructure. DIY skills using locally sourced materials inspires innovation and expands to new businesses, products, and services. Individual use expands to others. Communities flourish through innovation and education. These, improve, these improvements receive, um, reduce the perceived need to migrate away from their own families and communities and into overcrowded cities. Number 10, people across the socioeconomic spectrum to achieve energy independence, sustainable waste management and food security. Rich or poor, we all have these residuals. Number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Food waste is managed at its, sort, at its source and never reaches the landfill. Pollution from wood and charcoal burning is eliminated. Number 12, responsible consumption and production allows consumers to eliminate food waste from their homes and to produce their own renewable energy without relying on fossil fuels. Number 13, climate action reduces methane emissions and staves off use of fossil fuels. This is natural gas without fracking. Biogas, a gas made from organic matter is carbon and burned. Healthy soil from healthy fertilizer helps to sequester carbon and helps to regrow native plants and trees. Number 14, life below water, prevents animal and human manure from going into waterways reduces nitrogen pollution. Number 15, life on land, prevents deforestation. No need to cut down trees for firewood, especially in places where it is now prohibited by law. We give people an alternative where there once was none. 
reduce, reduces soil erosion, which in turn reduces deadly landslides. Forests have a, a chance to regrow. Through our applied research, research, we have learned that the fertilizer not only feeds the soil, it regenerates the soil. It comes back to life again. Dealing with waste at the source, seeing waste as valuable, quote unquote, residuals of daily life and using it for good stops the accumulation of our organic, quote unquote, waste in landfills. Number 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. Biodigestion brings peace through access to free fuel and the ability to grow one's own food just about anywhere. Biogas education programs bring diverse people together to learn and work together for the greater good. And number 17, partnerships for the goals. Solar Cities partners with other organizations and companies to share their biogas education program around the world from communities in the US and Canada to projects in Haiti, South America, the Middle East, Asia, Africa. And we look forward to future partnerships. A mentor of mine once asked, what do you think are the barriers to biogas? I said, awareness is number one, people don't know what it is. Number two is resources. People don't know how to build it or where they can buy it. So here are a few resources to get you started. You can find information on YouTube. You can check out our TED Talk. Um, please visit our website. We have a downloadable book. And um, I highly recommend if you really wanna get into the technical aspects of biogas, um, go visit uh, um, David House, um, his website. You just look up the Complete Biogas Handbook. And here is where you can reach us. We appreciate you for being here today and for listening to this very fast paced presentation. I apologize for that. Thank you. That is so, so, so amazing and information packed. We are so thankful to you, uh, Janice, for the contributions that you've made, for the collaborations that you're working on. And I think for giving us the opportunity to really learn the complicated nature and the ease in which we can actually commit ourselves to these practices. So you've really brought that into the space and we really, really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you for, for letting me share. Absolutely. And now without further delay, I'd like to turn it over to Alice, please. Uh, other Alice, not you, not my supervisor, but. <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, that was a fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. And it has perfect alignment with so many, um, so many efforts of California to create power and light as well. I'd like to confirm that everyone can see my presentation. Okay, terrific. So um, thank you, Tahil, for inviting me here today. Um, one thing I want to say about um, presentation, um, Janice's presentation, it fits in perfectly with Kiss the Ground, a documentary that some of you have probably seen, um, and it was just encouraged by uh, Interfaith Power and Light and our Faith Climate Action Week. So this is a real, real sign of hope for the future. Um, so I'm Alice Druffel, and I am the Southern California Director for California Interfaith Power and Light. I have been at this job since 2009. And um, our four, four aims, I would say, are energy efficiency, renewable energy, education, and advocacy. So we assist houses of worship and faith communities in California to implement the shared value of uh, creation care um, that we are all mandated to have. And California Interfaith Power and Light is part of a national network of 39 states that have IPLs. So a lot of what I'm going to address um, today in, in this uh, presentation um, are things that a lot of you already are active in. So I just wanna recognize the work that everyone on this call is doing. Um, 
but um, I'm just going to put forth a few uh, hard and fast actions that we undertake that uh, can easily be replicated in other houses of worship or faith communities. And I'd also um, like to say that not everyone, not everything that I'm going to address can be replicated by all the CCs on this call. Um, but the advocacy part is especially interesting and I hope to engender a discussion of what other folks are involved in in terms of climate advocacy. So um, just for my little uh, piece today, I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, guiding principles that uh, guide my work and then the faith climate nexus and then practical action. So, you know, preparing for this presentation, I took some time to reflect on one, what is it I really do? And how does our work make an impact? And what have I learned that I can take with me wherever I go? And so I came up with these four principles that I'm confident guides your work as well. So what guides my work is I recognize and embrace one, the healing power of interfaith efforts. It's really amazing that in um, my work for climate action, I'm in a unique position to build relationships and build bridges of understanding and friendship among diverse peoples. I recognize that all climate work is relational and personal as opposed to objectified. So you hear some people say, I'm, I'm working to save the earth. Okay, first of all, it's right away, it's like a subject object. It's like, I am the subject, the earth is the object, which is completely wrong. <laughs> um, there is no subject object. Um, we have been trained, unfortunately, by some of our faith um, traditions that humanity is above the created world, but we're actually not above. We are within the created world. We are creatures ourselves. And if we're objectifying the earth, we're separating ourselves from the natural world. And we're doing this out of a sense of not really knowing who we are. Uh, the third principle um, is to recognize that working solutions and efforts on climate change must address systemic, racial, and social injustices. These are both and. And four, that the climate crisis is intimately interconnected to most major social justice issues public health, access to jobs, access to housing, migration, we see the results of severe climate um, events and we see the ensuing effects of more poverty, of lack of water, of forced displacement, of people moving from their beautiful homes when they don't want to, but forced by drought and other situations. So before I go on, I encourage you just to take a moment and acknowledge which of these four principles uh, might be at work, something that you think about a lot in your own work. And Take a moment to see how you can integrate that principle even more and perhaps make, you know, one or two mental or physical notes. Okay, so we go on to the faith climate nexus. Um, 
we all know that all major faith traditions, all traditions have the mandate to care for and protect creation. We are living, especially in the United States and wealthier nations with the false belief that climate care is optional. It is not. We have gotten away from a connection, a deep interconnection with nature, which some of our neighbors and friends in other countries will say, you know, I got a lot to teach you on this. Um, so this is a mandate for us. I like some of these, um, I, I love the one, I love these sayings, especially the one from the Holy Quran. And the servants of the beneficent God are they who walk on the earth in humbleness. And when the unlearned address them, they say, peace. So one, living in humility and living in a manner in which we bring peace to all, even though, even, even folks who would attack us. All right. So I'd like to go on to some actions. These are hard and fast actions that California Interfaith Power and Light undertakes that can easily be replicated. Um, and that, as I said, some of you on this call are actually doing right now. So some smaller scale actions. First thing is talk to your family and your friends and your colleagues about the climate crisis, about our role in it about your concern. I don't think that we as individuals actually speak. We're used to doing events like this, um, but I myself sometimes tend to shy away from speaking to my friends, my family about what I do. And this is an enormous um, potential for education. Within this talking, we don't um, have to force people to have our own viewpoint. It's more like asking a general question, listening. Uh, who knows, perhaps others that we speak to have been feeling a certain way about climate change and the climate crisis and severe weather events and the effects upon people all over the world. So at its foundation, we want to keep the lines of communication open. Another small scale action we can take is uh, setting up a green team in our house of worship. So some of you are um, active in, you know, environmental green teams, creation care teams, in your congregation. And this is pretty simple to set up. You can start with one very passionate person, a few passionate people. And then what you need to do is you need to ask yourself, where is my faith community right now? What issues are important to us? And then integrate the work of climate into the existing structure of what is happening. Um, there are, um, I can send a little bit of information about this afterwards, how to set up a green team in your house of worship. Um, but a couple of really good things to keep in mind when you are doing this is, um, like I said, get in where you fit in. Find where the energy of your faith community is and integrate into that. Mutual and empowering relationships are key. So there's not like, oh, well, 
we're trying to save the planet, so you should listen to us. <laughs> One, there's no saving the planet. <laughs> but um, everything should come out of a uh, working on um, an understanding of mutuality. And you should always kind of celebrate small accomplishments and really focus in on building relationships uh, of understanding. So I like this, um, the Muslim Green Team of the Islamic Center of San Diego made their own um, reusable bag and I use it all the time when I shop. Another small scale action is to um, set up regional working groups. So um, our diverse spiritual traditions call us to be agents for climate justice and we can set up groups of um, congregations or groups of congregations within existing environmental interfaith climate action groups. And we can focus on shared common values like advocacy, um, like education. And California Interfaith Power and Light has six um, working groups, or we call them affiliates. And one, of the, one example is the Marin Interfaith Climate Action. And um, they, in their mission statement, they include our advocacy for climate legislation and collaboration actions with other environmental organizations. Another small scale action that we undertake is we provide a lot of information on energy efficiency and renewable energy. So whoever you are, wherever you are, um, you can look at energy use, see how it can be reduced and then check into renewable energy. So admittedly, this is we have a um, solar and energy guide for congregations, and this is focused on California and the United States, but information can be gleaned for anyone. And uh, for folks in the United States, there are um, organizations that make solar possible using the federal tax credit. So it is possible. And uh, after this is over, I'll put in the chat, the um, link to getting the solar and energy efficiency solar debt. Okay, so other things, smaller scale action for any house of worship or any faith community. Host an event like a speaker, movie, discussion, Earth Day Fair. Um, okay, maybe we all can't get uh, Bill McKibben, <laughs> who is in there here. But hey, we're virtual, so why not? We can ask him. So it's fairly simple to plan, coordinate, and host an event. Um, Earth Day fairs take more planning, but it's a great way to bring folks in, see what's on their minds, link the event to other initiatives happening in your faith community. Uh, I wanna uh, call out the picture of the doggies being blessed is from a blessing of the animals event in um, 2016 at Holy Family Church in South Pasadena. People absolutely went crazy for this event. Um, one of my friends even brought his uh, chicken to be blessed. <laughs> so um, you can ask yourself, what is one small scale action that you've been wanting to do? What do you need to get it accomplished? And who will be your partners? So these are some kind of smaller scale actions that can be done fairly simply. I'd like to go to larger scale actions that California Interfaith Power and Light is involved in um, that can be replicated. And I must say that um, uh, we're happy to be a resource for you as well. So one, work in coalitions. Um, our organization is part of several coalitions in California. One is Green California that meets monthly. 
Um, we talk, there's about 120 organizations that are part of this. We talk about pressing climate and energy legislation that's up before the California legislation, legislature. We, um, it's just an excellent platform to learn about new legislation, which organization is leading which bill and to get support for each other's bills. We're also involved in an electric vehicle coalition, a plastics coalition, and this year, a Senate Bill 467 coalition, which I'm going to address later. So another um, large scale action is if your region is involved in uh, community choice aggregations would be great. This is when a region or several counties get together and they form, um, it's like forming a new utility. They can procure um, uh, renewable energy from renewable energy sources more than you know their other utility. And they can be assured that the advancement, the transition to a clean energy future is happening on a larger scale. So we have several uh, in California. We have Clean Power Alliance um, that Tahil and I are part of. Um, we have East Bay Clean Energy, Silicon Clean Energy. There's one being set up in San Diego. And it's a really interesting interplay between these community choice ag aggregates and the existing utilities. But this is something we're involved in in a political way as well. Another large scale action is to become involved in local advocacy efforts. So just recently, um, California Interfaith Power and Light here has been involved in Watts. Um, Watts Clean Air and Energy Committee and now Watts Conda. Um, we meet uh, weekly and we are involved in efforts to, um, to beautify Watts, to make it healthier in terms of clean water, clean air. And just last night, we had um, an electric vehicle event that was focused in Watts and South LA. But what you want to do is you want to be in tune with the needs of your local community. So what are the environmental injustices happening in your local communities? And how can you lend your capacity, your energy to that? So it's not like, oh, I'm thinking this is great. Let's put solar everywhere. I'm going to go into Watts and see if I can push this through. No, you start with the community. You listen and you learn and you take the lead from the community. Um, another thing that we're focused on is um, the phasing out of oil drilling in Los Angeles. And we are hoping that if we can do this in Los Angeles, that it can be um, replicated in other parts of the country. Parts of Texas are already active in this. Okay, so um, another larger scale action is uh, state advocacy efforts. So as I said, California Interfaith Power and Light every year uh, meets with all of our coalition partners. We come up with priority legislation and we have um, advocacy efforts, petitions, sign-ons, alerts, and we have two days in which we meet with Sacramento legislators on these priority legislation. I'm just gonna give a little bit of, of, of an example um, of an advocacy effort this year, which is extremely important. So um, for the last two years, 2019, 2020, we were involved in assembly bill 345, which would set up a 2,500 foot health and safety setback 
between oil and gas drilling and sensitive receptors, such as homes, schools, parks, recreation centers, houses of worship. And this is to protect public health because we all know that there are multiple um, studies that link oil and gas drilling to multiple um, cardiac respiratory illnesses, premature death, um, higher incidence of cancer. Um, in Watts, for example, a person, because of their close proximity to, to pollution and stuff, lives 11 years less than a person that is in a wealthier area, Beverly Hills or something like that. And this is a matter of environmental justice. It's a matter of racial um, injustice. And California, even though we're a leader on um, uh, climate and energy policy, we're really, really up against some difficult um, opponents in the, in the oil and gas industry. So there's a lot of oil in California. I mean, Los Angeles County was basically founded on um, oil and stolen water. And so we're dealing with that legacy now. So for, okay, so let's go back to this. Um, in 2019, 2020, we had Assembly Bill 345, which would have set a 2,500 foot setback, health and safety setback. It did not pass. 2020 was crazy, as we know. So it came back as Senate Bill 467 this year. And it included an, a gradual phase out of oil, of, of fracking. Unfortunately, last Wednesday, it died in committee in natural resources. So right now, the bill has been amended to take out the phase out of, um, of fracking and just include the 2,500 foot setback, which it originally was. But now we are in the unenviable position to get one final support vote for this, for it to be taken up again in the Natural Resources Committee, but we're against some very heavy opponents. Um, this, um, the first picture you see, the three California Senate Democrats who voted against setbacks, that was, that was in 2020. And now this year, amended California fracking ban will cut ban and keep the setbacks. And one person even wrote, has California given up its climate ambitions? Which would be really strange. Like California, come on. But still, we're up against heavy duty opposition and we need to be present. Uh, another large scale um, uh, effort that we're involved in is federal advocacy. Um, Last year, there was uh, a report from the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis entitled, entitled Solving the Climate Crisis. And what we did in California here is we held five roundtable um, discussions, events, with five Congress members that sit on this committee to get the information out. And this report, um, is one of the basic reports that people look to. It's not a piece of legislation. It's a report that can be used as the basis for federal legislation now. And right now I'm involved in setting up 30 meetings with Congress members on May 5th and May 6th to discuss the infrastructure plan of President Biden um, and how that relates to uh, clean energy and resiliency and electric vehicles. And we're also going to be talking about the Reclaim Act, which, which would in places like West Virginia, uh, set up um, a fund to clean up former coal areas and employ former coal workers. And thank goodness we have President Biden because we have a very, very hopeful path going forward. 
So those are things. And as we go forward, um, I hope we have the time to talk about other types of advocacy, uh, climate and energy advocacy that's happening in other parts of the world. So here's my information. And I thank you for the time um, and listening. I'll put some information in the chat. You can contact us uh, for hard and fast resources that can help guide your work as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alice. That was such a, a trove of information that, you know, reminds us of, you know, the individual power and the collective power we can have in trying to call on the powers that be to, you know, change the ways that we work on trying to fix, you know, things that might be economic or infrastructural in nature to reminding people that it's not just the community it's not just communities reaching out and calling those out who are in power, we're also reminding ourselves that we each can take a step in a positive direction trying to do this work. Um, and the way that Interfaith Power and Light has been doing it for many years now is a very clear testament of the kind of impact that you all are making because faith communities are paying attention and understanding that each of us has a footprint that we're leaving behind. We should check to see what kind of footprint that is, a good one or a bad one. Um, so thank you so much for, for being able to share that. Um, I uh, was thinking of, you know, using my time to be able to uh, ask a question, but I think I want to kind of turn it over to the audience, actually, because um, I think you both of you have provided so much information that I think a lot of folks are still chewing on. And I want to make this an opportunity where people can express themselves. Um, so before that, um, for everyone that's on your computer right now, um, I'll be conducting a poll in just a minute, uh, just to get a bit of your feedback about what you've heard about so far, um, how you've been able to uh, learn about things. It's just a couple of questions. It should take no more than two minutes. Uh, we'd love for you to take that poll. Um, and then we can go into the question answer section. So let me start that. Oh. Wow, I see what's happened now. Um, so I don't think I can do the poll because I believe someone has logged in on my device. Uh, but uh, what we can do instead is I would love for folks on the call right now, if you can, um, to please just uh, share some important lessons that you've gotten from both Alice and Janice about the ways that you're thinking about environmental justice work and how it's made you think about what next steps you might think about doing. Um, that would be really helpful if you just uh, put some of those thoughts in your chat box um, and we can really go from there. Oh, actually. Dial, I, I see a button that says I can launch a poll. Should I, should I press that? Yes, if you can, please. Okay. Because <laughs> I it's not allowing me to. <laughs> Is that working? Are people seeing that? I see it. Oh, great. Let's see. So I, I'm going to take people's words for it. It goes to show you how well technology works when you're the one that created the poll and now you're not the one that can conduct it or see what's happening with it. I feel so it much must, better. <laughs> it must be something about like hosting and co-hosting. I'm not sure because yeah. I can see it right now, but. Um... Yeah, most probably. Um, it, it happens. As long as the poll is getting done, that's what I care about. Right now it says, 75% have voted, 81% have voted. We're almost, we're almost complete. Okay. <laughs> Who wants to be the poll That's bearer? a good Who question to you. <laughs> Very good question. <laughs> <laughs> huh. That's to you. Well, I... <laughs> now, will, will, this, will this, will I be able to save this and then I can share it with you? Is that uh, what? It, should, it, it will actually save up automatically. Great. Um, so once the call ends, then it'll save it in the Zoom system so that I can check on the information later. 
Thank you all. It says all 100% have voted. So thank wow. you so much for sharing your feedback. Awesome. That's really cool. Thank you. 100% response rate. Now that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> Great. Well, I am now more than happy to turn it over to uh, folks with questions. Um, we, I just want to give everyone an update that some of the folks that uh, Janice had spoken about before, including um, Thomas Colhane, Boma Mohammed Chi, and Isabel Galeano are all here on the call as well. Uh, so if there are any questions you'd like to post to them about the work that they're doing, we definitely would love you to either raise your hand, which you might see at the bottom of your screen, or to drop a question into the uh, chat box, please. And the first question comes from our friend, Jasmine Haley. Let me unmute you. Hi, um, I'm representing the um, Christian science community and um, our numbers are, are slowly um, declining, but we do have uh, some interest in people who want to um, reach out and learn about uh, how they can um, and participate in environmental and green uh, sustainability. And so I just uh, wanted to want to reach out to the, the speakers and everyone for uh, resources and how to uh, reach them and how to give them information so they feel a part of the movement and part of. Um, so thank you so much for the information and presentation. It was so nice to meet all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jasmine. Um, I'll be sure that as a part of a follow-up to this call, uh, that everyone gets Janice's and Alice's contact information, so you can reach out to them for any questions or ways to collaborate. Be more than happy to share them. Uh, Hill, may I make a, a comment as well? And um, thank you, Jasmine. And if you'd like, you can uh, uh, put your, um, your email in the chat. But it's my understanding um, we do have quite a few Christian science uh, members in California, but our, it's my understanding that some of them are changing their names to centers of spiritual living. Um, is that correct? Okay, good. And um, I, I would love to uh, reach out more with you. Great, thanks for uh, sharing that, Alice. Um, yes, anyone who has any questions, please uh, make sure to raise your hand if your camera is on, uh, click on the raise hand or emotion, uh, emoticon button at the bottom of the screen, uh, or leave your question in the chat box. Um, Linda, let me unmute you. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the presentations. And I was wondering uh, what both of the presenters uh, think about carbon fee and dividend legislation at the national level and whether you advocate uh, for that. And also what you think about Citizens Climate Lobby as an organization. Um, we have one here in East Tennessee, in, in Tennessee and it's, um, uh, you know, it's because it's single focused on legislation, it seems to be a productive uh, type of organization. So I was wondering, wondering those two things. Thank you. Alice or Janice, would either of you like to answer? Sure. Well, I'm happy to, to, that I've met Alice because my strength is not in the area of legislation. Um, I'd like to team up and actually learn a bit more about that and how Alice does that. And uh, as far as the Citizens Climate Lobby, we have a very powerful group here in the Philadelphia area that, um, that are very active. We've gotten a lot of people to the Capitol. I don't know if TH could speak more to legislative stuff regarding biogas, but. I, I, I thank you for, for doing your wonderful presentations, both of you, and what a great group to be part of. You know, sorry I wasn't able to join earlier. I, I think we're really looking at the entire toolkit, right? We're looking at the entire smorgasbord in, in this in some panoply of solutions. And the policy fails us when there isn't enough lived experience with the I, the technologies, ideas, items of concern. And I think what, what Janice and I have been working very hard on, and now of course, Isabel, 
who was a student of mine and now is out in, um, in Africa. And, and of course our great colleague Boma is, it doesn't matter if you're a practitioner or inventor such as we're trying to cultivate, as long as you have some direct experience in your life with photovoltaic electricity, with biogas production from organic residuals, toilet waste or food waste, with, uh, with small scale wind power, because the mind tends to scale up, scale down from what it, the body mind is experienced and what the spirit is experienced. And I think our disconnect with policy is that we as citizens, we don't actually engage with the things that our hearts and spirits tell us are, are sustainable solutions that would be good for our communities, for our families, for our planet. And so when politicians, like uh, a good example would be um, Senator Paul Simon. I had to go out to Damascus, Syria to introduce him to a unitary regenerative fuel cell and the concept of turning wastewater into, into a good, into electricity and into clean water and heat. Uh, and he, he said, you know, if you tried to see me in Washington, you would have never gotten into my office, even though I'm a representative for you. He said, Ironic that you're out here in Damascus, the Assad Center, asking this question, can you come to the ambassador's house tomorrow night to the party and show me the technologies you brought with you so I can get a hands-on feel? And so we met at the party, and then all the Syrian officials are with us, and the United States officials. And Janice knows this very well. She's worked at this level as well. These are human beings with families, children, grandchildren, cousins, relatives, constituencies. And they, he said to me, all I hear are these lobbyists coming in with an agenda. And you know, they have dollar signs in their eyes and they're worried about their jobs. They're sucking up to the person that they're afraid they're gonna lose their job if they don't get X number of signatures, whatever it is. He said, I'm a, you know, an Illinois boy. I'm about, come to me, let's talk, let's see. And so he said, where are the young people today like yourself who are doing it or have experience who can speak with that lived experience, life-tested authority. And that's what Isabel's doing out there. Maybe Isabel can speak to this because when, when policymakers know that this is not just these fantasy-driven uh, you know, utopians, they'll, they'll call us, particularly those of us who are faith-based, there's a bit of this sort of like hardball sort of thing, even in, I'm an evangelical. And I have to say, even in the evangelical community here in Florida, people still see me as a bit utopian and sort of have, you know, the, these Pollyannish eyes as if the gospel could ever come true. And I'm saying, well, some of our technologies are the gospel. They're good news. And I'm an evangelical because an angel in Arabic means the good news. And an evangelical it comes from these roots. You know, you wanted to spread the good news. And people, how do you know it's good news? Well, I'm Thomas, right? So I touched the wound of some of these things. I, I've worked with them as Janice has, as Isabel and Boma has. I've seen like where the spear went in and where, where, where the leaks occurred and where it doesn't work. And I, we've lived the, through the winters. And so you go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna be living testimony, living witness to this good news. And then it doesn't matter to me anymore as it didn't matter to the early Christians, the Coptic, Zebeline garbage recyclers. I lived with Cairo when I was doing my PhD, the folks in Cappadocia who built the, mount, the, the, the underground cities to get away from persecution. Right? We all felt in whatever religious tradition we're from that being a minority and being you know, mis, uh, misunderstood because of it went with the territory, but we weren't going to give it up because we felt it. We're like, what are you talking about? I turn all my food and toilet waste into biogas. We're powering everything off photovoltaics here down at Rosebud. We put a windmill up at, at Jody's. We put biodigesters in, in Janice and Kathy's basements, right? So you're going... You can't stop us. We just need more of us. Sorry, it talks so long. Yeah, I think Boma Boma has had a similar experience where you know you invite you know somehow the government finds out what you're doing. First, you're in the community just doing it, and then somebody friendly sees it and 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 they're like, oh oh wow oh whoa light bulb, and and then we get invited to you know present somewhere with other politicians, right? Boma, isn't that what happened with you? It is. It is. It is. Uh, I'm sure we have the same situation here in Cameroon and in most African countries. You see, if uh, politicians have their own ways of thinking, and to get to politicians is not that all easy. You can be there doing the right thing, producing a lot, teaching people, but nobody is aware 
the politicians are not aware. They don't want to know because they don't even see what they will gain from it. That's the first problem. And then the second problem is how do you approach a politician? It's not easy to get close to a politician. So except you now have a friend or someone that you have convinced, actually, then he's also convinced that the technology works. That is when the friend links you now to the politician. And to table a bill to support us is not all that easy. That is why in Cameroon, the, te the technology in most African countries is not fast growing. You know, for the past years, we have been working. The communities are ready. Cooperatives, uh, associations, they have seen what we are doing. They are ready to accept the technology. They want to practice. They have seen the importance of such a technology to their life. Because like you said in your, in, in your, 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 your write-up or in what you share with us, it helps fight poverty. That is one of the most essential advantage of this technology. And that is why I see technicians, uh, politicians are supposed to pick this up to, you know, to reduce poverty. Then when it goes to climate change now, climate change, the impacts of climate change are now visible in our society. You see, we talk, you talk of uh, migrating people are moving from one place to another, they've been displaced because of the effects of climate change. We really feel it, even right in the rural areas. So I think what we are doing, the, 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 this biogas technology or renewable energy will really help if we can promote it, if we can practice it in our society, it will actually help to reduce climate change. So our main problem is to get these politicians, let them put it in their legislature, or let them try to bring out laws that can protect us or that can promote this technology. So we see face that difficulty. That's why we are left with this. We are left where we are today. If not, we could have moved faster. Like I said, there's a lot of projects that we can carry on. There are a lot of cry from the rural population, from the poor people that need this energy to cook. They need this energy for lighting. But with our, we can't afford them because we don't have the financial means. But we have the technical capability to push forward this technology, and they are ready to learn. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Boma. Thank you, Thomas. Thank you, uh, Janice, for the, your perspectives on that. Alice, I know you wanted to respond more directly to um, Linda's question, so please. Sure. Um, so to Linda's question about Citizens Climate Lobby, um, we have um, in our 39 states, we have uh, varying support or non-support with, with Citizens Climate Lobby, depending on what's going on in the state. But Interfaith Power and Light um, as a national organization is, has not yet supported or has not supported CCL. We come to this from a different point of view. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby, HR 763, is a fee and dividend where um, there's a price put on carbon and then money would go uh, directly back to um, utility rate payers. Um, and it doesn't have the environmental justice piece. Um, we, um, <clears throat> in California, we have, we have carbon uh, cap and trade. And so we have uh, a fee on the polluters the money goes to the state and then goes um, specifically to environmental justice communities and projects like recently $30 million in Watts to um, beautify Watts. Um, so it's just kind of a different point of view as you get, as you think about it. Um, personally, I'm agnostic because we do have to have a national price on carbon period. Um, but I would say that right now, it does take a lot in terms of unifying our voice for carbon tax, carbon fee, whatever it is. We have to not be split. That is the main thing, because that's what happened in 2009 with the possible Waxman-Markey bill. We were split on which, which you know, 
which federal carbon fee bill was the best. And I think that's very dangerous for us right now because we don't have the time to be split and have arguments on what the best is. That's why I'm personally agnostic. We need to have a national carbon fee. Um, but I have to say that local and state efforts are really where it's at right now. You know, for the last four or five years, even before that, the federal government was doing nothing. We as local communities, we as state communities are very, very active and we must continue to be active. And this biogas is a perfect example. You're taking this, you're affecting people on the ground, in local communities, in apartments, in houses, in countries, in farms, um, with our friend that just talked. That's the kind of thing we need. And we need to have support for that. So that's what I would have to say about that. Great, thank you for, for that response, Alice. And you know, this is such a good reminder of the kind of dedication that goes into um, seeing reforms when it comes to environmental sustainability, right? It's, we know who the big polluters are. They're mainly corporations, they're governments who choose to be irresponsible uh, or corrupt or whatever you wanna call them. Um, and it leaves a lot of the burden on us as communities who, yes, we play a big role as consumers um, and need to take our own personal and collective actions, but it doesn't exempt anyone else from being able to also change the ways that they're making sure that they're using fuel, that they're producing waste, that they're uh, thinking about how um, things like infrastructure, especially with the upcoming bill that President Biden is pushing for, can impact the way that we actually can survive as a society if we have brand new roads, but we can't breathe the air where we're driving on those roads. Um, so it's going to be a process that I think all of us need to really push on that balances between what do we do in our own homes and our own communities versus how do we step out and make sure that others are doing the same? How do we keep that interconnectedness going when it comes to um, helping the environment? Um, anyone else with any questions or thoughts that they'd like to share? Oh, yes, TH, go ahead. Thanks for, for the unmute. Um, the call that I was, the webinar that I got off that may be late for this one was with National Geographic's uh, high school program. And we were talking to this wonderfully organized group of young people out in Connecticut who out worldwide uh, audiences and speakers to come in, many from the Nat Geo roster, and spent the morning and we'll do more engagement and action tomorrow for a full day. Um, and when I had presented on Essentially, I think it's very similar to what Janice presented on, where we're dovetailing all the time in our perspectives. Um, they then had a speaker come on who was from a entrepreneurial corporation that was wanting to lay claim to the organic residuals and had a lot of wonderful tables and graphs showing how valuable food waste and, of course, all organic waste, farm waste, toilet waste, you name it, were and said lamentably they couldn't get enough to expand their business because the, the consumer level and the producer level at source of so-called waste wasn't cooperating. The mindset wasn't there. When they showed the graphs and showed the potential, people were, 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 were impressed. It was staggering. And as a young astute student asked, isn't there going to be a fight over who gets this? Isn't there a limited amount of food waste and toilet waste and agricultural waste at the end of the day? And I put in the chat here and I, I said to them as well, uh, neither the, that speaker or I felt any competition because, and I guess it's because as they have been framed by planet walker, John Francis, the African-American Nat Geo explorer who walked silently around the planet for 20 years without saying a word, uh, working on his spiritual knowing. And he's published a book and he started, he speaks now. He started uh, out, he was walking as he did the webinar this morning and he said, it really is about kindness and ethics and observing the golden rule. And when you realize the unlimited abundance that is coming in terawatts per minute from the sun and the unlimited abundance that's coming in from geothermal sources below our feet, that's a nuclear power plant down there, 
fission reactor, and there's a fusion reactor 93 million safe miles away from us up there. And the amount of life that is negentropic that grows working with microbes and working with, uh, with algae and working with uh, plants and fungi and animals, right? When you look at, at that negentropic tendency, you realize that Matthew 26 and the, and the Sermon on the Mount isn't an abstraction. The abundance is there. And we in the, in the big industry and the small industry are all complaining that the, the source, the kitchen, the, the bathroom, the cafeteria, the, uh, the, the food court, the, you know, you, you name it, the, the, the food depot, the supermarket, it, until we get enough cooperation there, none of us can do what we want to do and demonstrate and compete with the fracking industry that was wonderfully talked about by you, Alice, right? Once we say, as I put in the chat, hey, we're not against natural gas. In fact, we want a natural gas domestic produced future, but 100% of it needs to be from renewable natural gas until we've used up 100% of the organic residuals that so easily at the home level and industrial level can be turned into biogas. Will let us work as citizens in our communities and our communities of faith on the logistics of who gets which organic waste. But this is a stupid competition. Who's going to get the waste that right now is going in landfill and is the third largest greenhouse emitter? Come on. But empower us to work these details out and say the mandate is you don't touch fossil gas or fossil liquid until 100% of the dead weight residuals and negative externalities have been internalized. And we're still going to prosper. It's not going to be you give up your cows and you're not allowed to fly. Delta just sent me a whole thing on their Earth Day commitments to uh, upping the amount of biofuels in their, in, in their fleet. You know, I mean, we're, all corporations are made up of people. And we're vilifying the people when, of course, we know habeas corpus in a corporation that they should be treated as individuals is wrong. Corporations are not people. They are places where people work. And I think if we can get people to people and say it is possible with renewable natural gas, aka biogas, at all scales to eliminate this waste problem. And I said this to the American Biogas Council when they said there just isn't enough waste in America even to power our truck fleet. And I said, I want that day to come when you've powered all the trucks you can and you go, oh gosh, the world's too clean. You mean there's nothing going into landfill? There's no methane emissions coming out whatsoever. There's no garbage. There's no flies. There's no rats. There's no disease. And now you're worried about where to turn next? Okay, turn to the sun directly. Seriously. But we've gone about it backwards. And that'll be the last thing I'll say because I'm taking up too much time. Janice and I believe, and Boma and, and Isabel believe, I, I know many of us believe that the solar plexus of the food energy water nexus is biodigestion, that that is the form of solar energy most accessible to everybody everywhere, regardless of economic level or location. And when that's taken care of, then the more expensive and engineering wise exotic materials of solar thermal and photovoltaic and wind that require manufacturing, they then come in, they plug in really nicely. And we've got to let everybody know that solar energy starts with biodigestion and then we move out, it becomes much easier to plug those pieces in. <clears throat> Ph, I don't think you ever have to worry about <laughs> taking up time because you're speaking so much truth to power. Honestly, it's what people need to hear. It's what people want to hear, and um, it's it. These are just the reminders that we need to keep this work going. Um, COVID nineteen made it very clear that some of this work was almost impossible, but it became incubators in a lot of ways. If I remember Janice telling me correctly, where we actually got more busy than we did probably before the pandemic, which means we have opportunities to adapt and we have been adapting. If we can adapt to doing all of these good things, then we can adapt ourselves to prevent ourselves from doing all of the bad things that we've done for decades now. So the time's overdue, we should probably adapt. So yes, uh, we're slowly hitting towards 10 o'clock uh, here Pacific time. So I want to take an opportunity to let folks, of course, uh, reflect and share anything. Janice, I saw your hand go up first. And then Alice, you want to say something? I wanted to ask Isabel and Harry if something special happened last night. 
<laughs> we were celebrating our first flame um, in Tanzania. We've been very, uh, we haven't seen so many, or we don't know until now, any IBC tank that is functional and is working. So we are trying to open this door. So we are in Arusha, Tanzania. And yesterday, what is that we got yesterday? So you can tell them. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, my name is Mr. Charles. So yesterday we got like a nice flare, blue flare from yeah. the IBC. I have never had such an experience for like the IBC tank. It's my first time to go through experience of the IBC tank. So um, we are we're so happy in Tanzania and also to, to, to I mean, to knowledgeable people because IBC, IBC tank is easy is, and affordable, even that it, it accumulates a lot like a small space to put the IBC tank. So our dragon is alive yeah. and it's working good. The plane was so huge and beautiful, so we're really happy. I, I yeah. was screaming. I was screaming. My husband's my <laughs> husband was was saying, "Who's Wayne? Who's Wayne?" I'm like, "No, I'm saying yay, yay." <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it was beautiful. That, yeah, so it's, it's nice that you get to share that with TH and the team because yeah, it's it's really nice to see it just working. And I have to I have accumulated so accumulate so much theory, but no practice. So when it comes to practice, it's just so exciting and beautiful to see it working. And now we're ready to start, to start teaching, to start building, to yeah. start like, yeah, yes. you're ready. Yeah. Fabulous. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Alice, you wanted to say something. Uh, yeah, really, <clears throat> really. <laughs> I'm honored to be in a space right now with all the amazing people from the so thank you. Um, Janice, are there any regulations against building a biogas um, machine digester for small houses in the United States? Do you know anything about that? Because I'm, um, I'm just ready to just tell everyone to do this. <laughs> There, um, from our experience, there actually are no regulations because it's not a popular thing right now. Um, I've actually been invited to come down to Florida to speak with a lead architect who is doing tiny homes. He's doing affordable housing and he would like to put biodigesters in there. Um, I'm also working with um, Stephanie Senna who is working on tiny homes, a tiny home village, actually a couple of them for the city of Philadelphia. So there's some interesting stuff going on with that right now. So um, there, there are people that are trying to get, they're working to get it in there. And I would love to speak with you more in detail about that um, because I think I could really learn a lot. I think together we could really push this forward and protect any kind of legislation, protect people you know, who wanna do this. Yeah, it actually kind of makes me wonder how um, the approach to having biodigesters can really change the way that, you know, a state like California, which focuses a lot on, you know, major agriculture to, you know, major, um, like we have, we're the most populous state in the United States, particularly, how we can think about those best practices and trying to approach so many of the different things that we might be doing or, you know, wasting because of current agricultural practices. Um, and it's also really helpful for me to think about, you know, with current housing situations with homeless populations and the fact that you're actually being able to connect with a builder that's helping with affordable housing is a really fantastic way to think about how sustainability helps fight poverty and how interconnected those things are when we actually see the grand scheme of, oh, hey, you know, you want to be able to help communities get uplifted out, out of the cycle, give them the, the tools and the resources to make sure they can do it. Yeah, sometimes we have, oops, sometimes we have to change our language. So oftentimes if we say, instead of a biodigester or biogas, we'll say, this is a liquid composter. And we can also collect fuel to cook on this grill 
or on my stove in the kitchen. So, or it's a septic system. Oh, there's TH. <laughs> sure. <laughs> I see your TH, I'm unmuting you. I accidentally remuted. Um, I, I've been putting biodigesters around the world since 2009. And I put three in California in 2010 and then put a professional Israeli home biogas commercial unit, which Janice and I have been uh, helping the company deploy. They just shipped me the latest one today. It arrived in a box um, and watched people not use them. And we both have a lot of experience over the past decade in where things fall apart. And ironically, even when your ISO 9001, 9004 listed, CE listed, the, uh, there's lawyers that have gone to town in, in Israel working with American lawyers to show that it's safe and effective and permitted. Um, there is a cultural thing almost universally in the United States that is preventing long-term use and adoption. And we're blessed to have uh, Janice and, and Kathy and, and the other biogas innovators and practitioners who now make up our 14,000 strong Facebook group of people who are early adopters because they see the vision and aren't gonna give up when there's a minor leak or spill. In America, it seems that we rely on professionals in order to do a lot of things. And when things go wrong, we expect the warranty to cover it and people to come in and fix it. Just the other day, Linda Schneider, part of the Home Biogas Owners Group, had a, she's, they've now, based on our work, the company now sells a toilet that you connect to your food waste digester. Um, it's like a, a RV toilet that you connect to it. And there was a, a blockage at the other end where it goes out into the uh, overspill area. And she said, I'm thinking of, um, of returning the unit. So we got on the horn and started talking with her and calmed her down. And, and since she admitted also, look, this is, this is hard culturally for Americans to accept, but the problem is the way we define Americans. And we believe that if we can find those early adopters who are a little bit edgy, people who, you know, they're, they're, they're the people who would have done civil disobedience in the past. And this is gonna be my point. When things are crucial, whether it's the horrible murder of George Floyd, or it's uh, terrible things in civil rights, uh, you know, just uh, hate crimes against Muslims, hate crimes against against Asians, whatever it is. We Americans are very good at standing up and saying, "You can beat me with a baton," as my father was beaten when he was working with the African American movement in the '60s. Uh, you can, you can, you can humiliate me. You can put me in jail, but I'm going to do it. And our young people, even seeing how the incarceration rates for marijuana, said, "You know what?" We don't mind going to jail for trying to legalize uh, marijuana, and we're going to fight that fight. I keep saying, well, if you're willing to drink before you're 21 and risk that, you're willing to smoke marijuana and risk that, and you're, for good reasons, willing to go out and march in the streets, for gosh sake, let's get biodigesters in your hands and let you push this so it becomes a thing where somewhere within a half an hour radius or an hour radius, there's an active biodigester being successfully used by a family who aren't going to give up. And they go, oh, gosh, I should have one, too, as I think many of you are saying. But when it fails once, the buzz gets around. Oh, somebody had a leak. Well, we chose when we worked with Kathy Puffer, who's part of our Solar Cities organization, who's out there doing workshops today as well. And we put the first basement biodigesters handmade in her in her home in New York with her two little girls, two little girls and her husband, an IT specialist. And those baby dragons burped and farted and made smells and spills all over. This woman wasn't going to give up. And she said, kids, let's make this work. And for a year, my students and I would travel up there and tweak and fix. And they were so patient. And the house would stink till we figured out to make it so it would never stink. I think now that, the, now that the, the, the technology is mature and it really, really works, it still is not a matter of getting it out to the average consumer. Our, our URI network has to identify places of faith and worship. We went to the mosque here and, 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 uh, and, and built a composter. Uh, they weren't quite ready for a biodigester yet. They've been up here to see ours. But if we can get, right? I mean, Boma, I think you'd agree too. I mean, uh, President Ob Obasanjo of Nigeria brought me to build digesters in the schools and the churches in Abiyokuta, Nigeria, because he said, this is where people are going to go home and say, mom, dad, biogas really does provide clean fuel out of garbage. And if we don't have that, the early adoption isn't going to happen here, I'm afraid. So I'm hoping you at URI will help us identify 
the people who say, yes, I'm committed for the next 10 years. <clears throat> yeah, TH, I think, you know, that that is actually addressing a really important, you know, point because things like, you know, the death of George Floyd and the ways that we see the very visible traumatic examples of injustice are what oftentimes drive us immediately to want to ask for reforms. And unfortunately, I don't think people are acknowledging the climate emergency the same way because it's not happening in front of them the same way that George Floyd's death did, which means we shouldn't wait for the climate emergency to end up in, on our backyard just for us to be like, oh, we should finally act. But unfortunately, we're still super reactive. And I think you raised a really significant point there that in spaces of things like racial justice, like justice for the LGBT community and others, they can be more mobilized by focusing on something like bringing a biodigester into their community, which serves as a direct solution to the very issues that they're fighting against, which is actually super fascinating. That is the kind of intersectional justice that we're looking for because if LGBT community members have their own patentry to make their own food and they don't have to depend on oppressors to get them their food, that's more helpful as they're trying to fight for the justice and equity that they deserve as well. It gives them a literal fuel that they need to be able to escape the, the cycle of injustice that they keep getting stuck in. Same goes for communities like you were mentioning Alice and Watts. Uh, when folks have access to environmentally sustainable solutions like wind and solar power, like uh, bio uh, digesters and stuff like that, the community will beautify, the community will improve because they have access to things they didn't have before. And it's allowing them to actually not start from zero anymore. And that makes a difference in every single aspect of how a community functions and thrives. Um, yes, it, it, TH, I'll let you make this last comment because we're hitting the top of the hour. Thank you, and I'm sorry to dominate, but I have one thing very relevant to say about South LA and Watts. Uh, we built a biodigester in the backyard of Alvaro Silva who was one of my students who at the time when I met him in ninth grade at Jefferson High School on, uh, you know, where they filmed the movie Devil in a Blue Dress. It's the, the, it was the Harlem of, of, of LA in its time. Wonderful cultural area. And we built biodigesters in 2010 in his backyard. And when I'd met him in, in ninth grade, he'd been a drug dealer and a gang member. And then he became a renewable energy specialist and he built solar houses with us. And he's a wonderful young man, wonderful family. But when he built the biodigester, it was the most successful one we'd ever put in L.A. because the community, as you say, really valued it. The problem is we came back from a trip to Alaska, showed up at his house and it was gone. And he said, where did my and these are three IBC tags, you know, what I mean, three big tags. Where did my biodigester gone? Rumor had it that when he was gone, some dope dealers had discovered that it was great producing great fertilizer for hydroponic operations and yeah. stolen it so that they could grow marijuana sub rosa in some basement or warehouse or, and then have electricity from the gas heat for the plants from the gas and the fertilizer but we never recovered it again the the point i'm trying to make is i know we don't we don't celebrate sub rosa you know informal economy activity when it deals with with things like drugs however now that marijuana is being legalized, I think that's why I mentioned it. I don't, I don't smoke marijuana. I have no business with any drug. But now that medical marijuana and other marijuana is legalized, one market that could get this really pushed forward is what they knew in South LA. They looked and they said, we're small entrepreneurs in an informal economy, and we need to do stuff in an efficient way. Boy, would the biodigester help. And we also, prior to that, had put solar panels throughout South LA to make a rap recording studio that was off grid, and they couldn't shut the electricity off as they were always doing for the poor communities. So we know it works, but we in the sustainability space so rarely engage with people who are in underprivileged situations. We always say, oh, we're gonna help, you know, we're gonna help in another country. We all see that, a peace core, you know, but what about our own poverty? And recognizing this, as Boma was talking about, you were saying Boma and, and Isabel, and we'll talk about that incredible engineering bricolage spirit that people who've had to struggle against the odds when government policies aren't working and when, when, uh, when the market's not working, 
It's the people who've been on the margins who immediately go, hey, you absorb some of the risk for me and help me make sure this doesn't fail. I'm there for life. I'm in. And I think that's what we got to work on in America. And I think that's a really powerful way to wrap up and share our gratitude with Janice and Alice for the amazing stuff that they presented on this call. Um, and to each of you who participated today, shared your perspectives and we're here to listen and learn uh, because the work for our climate and our ecology is a never ending process, but it's something that we all have an opportunity to contribute to positively. So uh, please be on the lookout for a follow-up email from me in the next day or two, and please take care of yourselves and each other. Thank you all so, so much. Thank you.